Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. You know, we love classic Lamborghinis here on this website, and it's funny that I'm old enough to remember these cars and they were new, and now they're classic. So I remember buying Road and Track and seeing this car on the cover and just being astounded by it. Uh, this is a 1965 or 66, it's, it's really that period, uh, a Lamborghini. And uh, Andrew Romanowski, he's president of Lamborghini Club. He always finds club members to, to bring this stuff over to the shop, and it's really exciting. So we'll find out the history of this car. Andrew, come on in. How you doing, buddy? Good. Great to see you. Well, Thanks I love this color. Is, is that, was that a factory color back in the day? Yeah, it was a factory gray. Uh, the guy who restored the car and owns it, Malcolm Barksdale, he had the car completely restored except for the engine. Right. But the, the paint color you asked about, it's the same except for he added a little metallic to the color. Okay. Now, I think everybody is familiar with the story of uh, Fruccio Lamborghini. He was a tractor, manu tractor manufacturer. Uh, he bought a Ferrari, was not happy with the clutch. A couple of old Italian guys yelling at each other, went back to Ferrari, says, your clutch are no good, blah, 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 blah. and Ferrari said, hey, go build your own car. I think, you know, just the classic, Ferrari got in fights with everybody. Peter Monteverdi, who was a Ferrari dealer, that's the Monteverdi over there, he got in a fight with Ferrari. He built his own cars. So the, probably more cars were started <laughs> the fights with Enzo Ferrari than almost anything else. And this was his very first attempt at building a car. I thought it was uh, tremendously successful. Although at the time, there was some controversy. People did not think this body was that attractive, did they? No, it was a little bit different way of thinking. You know, it was at a time where there were a variety of classic GT cars, and this fit into it. You know, it had a little bit different shape than what other people were doing at the time. Think about some of the American cars that were being developed in the right. early 60s. And the thing about Lamborghini in this period was, this was probably one of the smoothest V12s of all time. He didn't want to build a race car for the world. He wanted to build a road car. He wanted to build a car that would do what he wanted his Ferrari to do. And most of the road car Ferraris, unless they're really expensive, were, were uh, single cam. This yep. was a four cam. Uh, I think it's 3.5 liter. Correct, yeah. 350 horsepower, which was tremendous back in the 1960s. You know, most American cars had 85 to 185 horsepower. 350 was a big, big number. And being super Leggera coachwork, it was fairly lightweight. Barani wire wheels, disc brakes. Um, this was a long distance classic Touring GT car. Uh, this is a Touring body, is that correct? Correct, it was made by Touring. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I love the look of this thing. I think it's, it's timeless, and I think as, as it ages, it, it gets better looking. Uh, back in the 60s when everything was, this car was, I don't know whether it's too roundy, it just, mm -hmm. it just didn't capture people. But I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite elegant. And how many of these did they build, do you know? Uh, there was a, approximately 120 okay. uh, 350 GTs built. Right. There's a little bit of controversy yeah. you know, on the exact build number because you know, records were kept on you know, just pen and paper. Right. So it was a, a lot different time period. And then the 400 came in fairly quickly after this, didn't correct, it? Correct, correct. Yeah. This was a success. So they came up with uh, you know, the 400 GT, which right. was really just a 350 GT with a four liter engine in right, it. Right, right. And then they came out with the 400 uh, 2 plus 2, which is uh, Jack Riddell's car. Right. Jack Riddell, you might remember, his has the distinction of being, I think, the highest mileage Lamborghini. I think uh, in the world. In yeah. the world, yeah. yeah. 250,000 miles, something like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the difference between that car and this car is this car, the engine has never been opened up. Uh, by the engine, I mean the bottom end. It's never been taken down. I mean, uh, carburetors have been taken off and cleaned, obviously. Uh, I'm sure generators. This has an alternator or a generator? Uh, this has an alternator. An alternator. Yeah. Did it have it right from the factory alternator? In, uh, you know, sure, that's, in Jay, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, that, I'm not sure. I that was, about, they did have that was about alternator period yeah. because the Mustang 64 was generator 64 and a half, 65, then it went through. So yeah, that would have been an alternator mm -hmm. car. And this was not a cheap car. I think this car was about $18,000 Yeah, yeah. in 65, 66. I know that doesn't sound like a whole lot right now, but you could get a Cadillac for five thousand dollars, wow. top of the line Cadillac. Mercedes was probably seven to eight thousand dollars. So eighteen thousand dollars. The Mura was twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars. I mean, my parents paid nineteen thousand for our house <laughs> in '59. 
So that shows you can have the house yeah. or the car. Well, of course, I would have preferred the car, but my parents didn't want to live in a Lamborghini, so we had to get a house. But right. uh, I mean, that shows you how expensive it was, but very, very elegant and just a beautiful looking car. And of course, Barani wire wheels. That's the prettiest wire wheels I, I've ever seen. And to this day, nobody makes a better looking wheel than that, in my opinion. It's got yeah. the proper knockoffs on it. Now, Bizzarini designed this motor, correct? Correct. As you can see, it's got side drafts on it. Every Lamborghini used a variation of this engine right up until, what, the Diablo? Uh, actually, all the way through the Murcielago, Jay, yeah. they, it was a traditional 60-degree uh, V12 right. with dual overhead cams, very similar to the original engine design. This is the same engine as Espada, Mira, Mira S, and Countach, except instead of having side draft carburetors, the carburetors are uh, uh, downdraft. And uh, because obviously you couldn't close the hood, right. you know, that's why they went to the side draft. The Bizzarini designed engine originally had the carburetors on the top for a right. little bit more power. Right. And as you mentioned, they moved the carbs on the side, you know, for a, um, you know, a better packaging of the engine. But all the classic Lamborghini touches, the beautiful cast pieces here. And, oh, it's just, just a wonderful, wonderful engine. These are just bulletproof motors. I mean, I've had mine since 86. They get a bad reputation because people try to do fixes on fixes on fixes. If you put the car together the way it was meant to be, it'll last a long time and, and, and run forever. Classic wood steering wheel, which I always like. Uh, these are all your toggle switches. I always like toggle switches. You know, these were outlawed after about 66, 67. Had to go with rocker switches. And I'm surprised these are actually labeled. Uh, that's windshield wiper, that's fan. I'm not, sh I'm not sure what some of these do. That must be fog lights. Uh, most of the Lamborghinis, they had switches up here like the mirror. And if you didn't know, well, then you had to learn or memorize. You notice there's no pattern here that tells you what the gear shifts. If you could afford this car, you, you should be able to figure out how to shift it. The people are a little more responsible in their own action back in those days. Got your standard warning lights up here. Uh, notice no radio, no air conditioner. But that was fairly common. Air conditioning was a huge deal in the 60s and very, very expensive, especially in Italian cars. So very few cars had it. And you had your, uh, I guess that's your, is there a cigarette lighter here? Oh, here it is. Cigarette lighter here. And of course, you have to have your Italian ashtray, which holds exactly one ash. And then you lock that like that. But just beautifully laid out. I like the sort of Art Deco looking numbers. I like that font that they use. That's really period correct. He's got a little navigation unit here. Your glove box. There you go. Actually holds a pair of gloves. Uh, beautiful leather interior, but very straightforward, easy to understand. You know, most American cars just had idiot lights like this back in the 50s and 60s. So to see actual gauges, amp, uh, fuel, temperature, water temperature, and of course uh, you have your speedometer and uh, kilometers per hour and of course your tachometer right here. Notice the red lines at 7,000 which was unbelievable back in the day. Uh, most American cars peaked out at 5,200 so to, and 6,000 was the end of the world so I have a car that with a red line was 7,000. In fact I remember there was a movie with James Conn called Red Line 7,000 and people are like going crazy oh my god 7,000 miles. So that uh, it's just just all the kind of fun period stuff. Something else interesting, Jay, this is an aluminum body car. Right. You know, which was, uh, you know, nice. It's a little bit more, you know, work when you're restoring a car to work on an aluminum body. Right. You know, as you know, but it, it created a, a lightweight platform for the car. Right. You know, the performance specs on this car for the time were, you know, tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Because you know? anything under zero to 60, under seven seconds was just lightning bolt Yeah, fast, absolutely, you know? especially in that time period. Yeah. As you mentioned, the horsepower, you know, during this time is... Uh, you know, unheard of. Yeah, yeah. And it has the, right here, what does it say? Oh, Super Leggera construction. Yep. Which I guess translates loosely to the super lightweight. Correct. Uh, you know, all tubes and uh, impossible to repair if you get an accident, but, <laughs> yeah. but, very fa but very strong and very lightweight. Now we have a book here. This is kind of cool. This is what I like. You get hey. all the original it's amazing that the owner of the car, Malcolm, was able to get some of these materials. Yeah. You know, he's got a factory brochure there. I remember going to the auto show and getting tons of these uh -huh. and reading them, and then my parents using them as coasters, and then oh, they got no. thrown. And now they're like five hundred dollars a piece. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so they got that, and you've got. Then uh, this is the really cool part. These are all the factory 
uh, uh, spec sheets on the car when everything Correct. you know. These were the documents created when the car was built. Here's the uh, exterior color uh, here. Right. Here's the uh, interior color. Okay. See, I can't tell if I'm reading an Italian menu if that's the color, but it's all in Italian. And Absolutely. He's, 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 he's all the number here. He's the number here. But got in the He got everything. I mean, it's. Just where did he get all this from the factory? Yeah, he was able to get these documents from the factory, which is, uh, you know. Okay, here's the car. It's hard to believe something could this could sit unloved and unwanted like this, but this is what the car looked like when he got it. Mm -hmm. So you can see there's quite a bit of work uh, going to be involved. Let's open the trunk. You know, something we always talk about, Jay, when we bring the cars in is the, the limited trunk space, you yeah. know, which they are obviously, but this one, interestingly, uh, maybe with the front engine configuration, actually has a trunk. Yeah, it actually has a trunk. I can you know? see you're not married because you're not going anywhere <laughs> two people with that. I mean, you know? if you're a guy, you can stuff some underwear in there and a toothbrush, but that's about it. But, but you actually got quite a bit of space behind the seat as well. Right. All these cars used to come with fitted luggage. I, I never quite, I don't see guys with, uh, you know, Gull wings driving around. I know where you go. Where do you go with fitted luggage? It just always makes me laugh. But this had it too. You could get the luggage yeah, as well. Absolutely. And very. I mean, look how light. I mean, that's very lightweight. You don't want to get hit by an SUV in this thing. There you go. And she just seals nicely. Let's take it for a ride. Well, this car drives very much like my uh, Espada. You know, the interesting thing about cars in this period. It's not that it has a lot of horsepower, which it does for the period, that it has such usable, smooth horsepower. It's very turbine-like. You know, when you had 350 horses in an American car back in the 60s, you know, you're thinking uh, Hemi's and, you know, big right. motors and, bah, 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 you know, cami deals, solid lifters, all that kind of thing. These are turbine-like. You know, modern engines are so smooth, even four-cylinders are smooth as kind of the early 12s, but right. I remember David E. Davis used to say in Car and Driver, everybody should drive a V12 car at least once in their life, just to get that smooth rush of torque. And this is really where it comes from. Very sophisticated engine, you know, twin cam, two valve, which is uh, the height of Exotica back in the 60s. Absolutely. You know, nowadays you can get an Econo box that has a twin cam engine, it doesn't seem like anything, but that was uh, pretty cool stuff. Very nice car to drive, good sight lines. You can see the hood seems extremely short when you're sitting in the, uh, behind the wheel, unlike the Espada, which has that long, low hood. I mean, it's really a nice size automobile. You know, when you see pictures of these things, they appear big when you see them sitting by themselves, but proportionately, it's a very nice car, and it's raining here, so we're not gonna uh, go too crazy. You know, most of the modern Lamborghinis are rear engine cars. Right. And this is a front engine uh, car. Right. You know, how does it change the, the Lamborghini experience in driving this? You know, you know I always like front engine cars. To me, it's that classic sort of uh, style. I grew up in an era when everything was front engine, where mid engine was the, the odd way to go. You know, these cars track very nicely. Mid engine is something that really pays huge dividends, I think, on the track. On the street, the advantage to a front engine car is engines in the front, transmissions in the middle, rear ends in the back, and it's easy to work on everything. Absolutely. You know, front wheel drive, really tight and complicated under the hood, and mid engine, you're standing on the interior trying to get into it. You know, I remember right. guys with 914 Porsches just traipsing all over the seats, and it, your back goes out leaning over trying to work on the thing. So this was, uh, this was an exotic car. You can actually work on yourself. This is not really a complicated car. I mean, it did seem complicated back in the day, but ignition, oil filters, everything is easily accessible. Even the valve covers, you don't have to take a lot off to get to them. The great thing with this is just the long pull, any gear. These are really driver's cars. You know, you don't have power steering. Uh, everything is nicely weighted. The greatness of the Lamborghini of, these, of this period was they were no compromised road cars. Ferruccio did not want to go racing. He didn't see the value in it. He wanted to build cars that people could drive swiftly across the continent of Europe at high speed, you know, with your mistress sitting next to you and smoking a cigarette. Ferraris and uh, Maseratis, these were mostly race cars detuned for the street. 
and you had to, they sputtered and choked when you went slow and you had to get out and, you know, rev them hard and do, I mean, there was work involved. Ferruccio wanted a car where a guy could get in, press the clutch down, everything was smooth and interacted. It wasn't all about ultimate horsepower, ultimate speed. It was about sophistication. And that's where Lamborghini really, uh, I think, aced out Ferrari in those days was, it was a sophisticated car that uh, just had a lot of class and was easy to operate and was reasonably dependable. But this is a wonderful GT car. If I had to compare it to a modern car, I would compare it to like an Aston Martin DB9. Not an all-out race car, not a supercar for the street, but a very competent, high-speed, uh, extremely comfortable, um, fascinating car to drive. You know, this everything's very linear. You step on the gas and you don't lurch forward. You you pull forwards. You make progress swiftly. Put it that way. Yeah. That's what's kind of fun about it. But when you get those revs up, you know, this, this was meant to secure the Lamborghini name. They're very carefully put together and very well put together. Very sophisticated car. Now, something else people forget about this period is this generation of cars, 65, 66, was the last pure design. By that, I mean whatever you designed and built, you could put on the road. There was no bumper minimum height. There was no uh, lighting requirement other than you had to see the road. Uh, there was no headlights have to be this high, hood has to be this long, whatever it might be. You whatever know, you designed, you could put on the road. That's why I think my two favorite years are 1932 for car design and 1966. Because from 66 on, the party was over. You had to have this much bumper protection. You had to have, remember all the rubber bumper cars that came along in the 70s? The five mile an hour bumper, you know, all this kind of thing. You have to be able to hit a pedestrian and he's got to get up <laughs> laughing. And, you know, all these sort of rules. But prior to 66, you could build a car with a thin A-pillar like this. Believe me, if you rolled this car, this thing would crush like a beer can. Oh, wow. I mean, you, you'd have a broken neck and you'd be dead. Whereas nowadays, how many times you get on the freeway, you see an SUV balled up like it's three feet tall and three feet wide, and people are standing next to it on a cell phone. Right. So yeah. car safety has come a long way. These cars were built with really no, <laughs> no pretense towards car safety, no telecop no telescopic steering wheel, uh, these sort of toggle switches that would put your eye out, you know, and just uh, hilarious, but uh, they are beautiful. Wow, what an automobile. I want to thank uh, Malcolm Barksdale for letting us uh, borrow this car. You know, that kind of shows you the Lamborghini people really like their cars to be driven and really use them. And uh, as someone who, I remember being in eighth grade with my road and track, sitting in math class, reading about this car, you know, just getting a chance to drive it, it it's such a thrill because it seems so exotic. And it, and it is, it really is an exotic automobile. And to think that this is a 50 year old car that you could drive to San Francisco tomorrow. Uh, they drove it up from San Diego in the rain uh, so that shows you the uh, Lamborghini guys really use their automobiles in, in, as, as they were intended. So Malcolm, thank you very much. This was uh, quite a thrill. I'm sorry you couldn't be here, but I hope you can come up in person. And no, we didn't scratch it or anything, and we're not <laughs> going to do a burnout. And uh, once again, thanks for uh, just a thrill of a lifetime. This is kind of a boyhood dream come true. See you guys next week.